Let's pray. Lord God, we, uh, we just lift up Pastor Adelson and, and Pastor Ron right now, Lord. We thank you for their, their lives, their ministry, the service that you've called them to, Father. We thank you that, um, Lord, they're in a position now where they're able to touch people around the world. Lord, we just pray that you would continue to bless them and anoint their ministry. Um, be with them as they travel home today. Bring them back to us safely um, and energized and, and ready to face the work that you have for them here. Lord, we pray for our time of... Um, your word this morning, Father. Lord, we pray that it would be your word that's spoken. Lord, we pray for, for soft hearts um, that are easy for your truth arrows to pierce. Lord, we pray for minds that are, that are open, empty of self and the ways and thinking of our flesh in this world, but focused on you and you alone as we desire to gain your heart and your perspective alone in how we live out this life, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. If you could turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. As you go there, when we accept Christ as Lord and Savior, and we, we choose to wear the name Christian, and we declare we are his disciples, his, his followers, there comes a point where each one of us must decide what that means for our lives. Is Christian a, a label? Is it a box that we check off on a survey or just a religious affiliation that we say we have? Um, is it a description of the kinds of activities we do on weekends or on holidays? Or is Christian an identity that marks the entire way that we live? Um, we have, that's a decision we have to come to. We have to, we have to actually be thoughtful and think about it. Um, in his book, Disciples Are Made, Not Born, Walter Henriksen concluded this. It is evident that one does not become a faithful person by being a weekend Christian. The faithful person is one who has applied the scriptures to every area of his life. So Christian living is a 24-hour day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, 366 days on leap year lifestyle. It is to permeate all areas of life. You know, I, I teach here in a school, I often tell my students that they can worship God in how they do their homework, in how they study for a test, or how they listen to a lecture. Um, Colossians 3, 23 to 24 says this, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. So really, in doing their homework, in following my instructions in class, it really has nothing to do with me. They're not even serving me. They're serving God. Um, so even in the most mundane, seemingly unspiritual tasks that we have in life, we're serving Christ, not men. I, I want to be clear here, though, that it is not perfection that is in view here. Serving Christ is not about never failing or never making mistakes or never messing up. In our hearts, are we humble? Are we doing our absolute best in all areas of life, not for ourselves, not even for others, but for our Lord Jesus Christ? You know, what are we offering to God? Romans 12.1 says we're to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. If we are living sacrifices, this means our whole lives are dedicated to bringing honor to God. Paul concludes that this is our spiritual worship. You know, we were singing the song, I want my life to praise you, right? Um, it's, a, it's a quick lyric and a very upbeat song, but think about just that one line. I want my life to worship you. The principle in view here is that there's no division between spiritual and religious activities over here and earthly or normal activities, if there's such a thing. Um, we must come to the place where we recognize that everything is spiritual. Everything ought to revolve around God, his purposes, and his ways. I mean, we could, we could get into some other discussion about how the spiritual existed first, and out of the spiritual came the physical. So it's all spiritual because God created it. Um, but the point is, everything revolves around God. Not just Sundays, not just Tuesday Bible studies, not the special church services, not the prayer before a meal, everything. So we conclude then 
that Christianity is not a box we check on a survey. Um, it is not something I say, oh, what, what kind of church do you go to? It's not an activity at all. It's a way of life. A way of li living that influences and impacts every area from the smallest things and the smallest choices we make to the largest things and the largest choices we make. Jesus himself laid out the priority here to his followers in Matthew 6, 33, when he said, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. We'll come back to that one a little bit later. The priority in life is always Jesus and living under his authority, his kingdom, and living transformed into his character, his righteousness. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Scripture is full of teaching and direction on how we as Christians ought to conduct our lives. Um, this morning, I'd actually like to go earlier in Matthew chapter 6 to the Lord's Prayer. And I'd like to look at the Lord's Prayer as a model for Christian living. Let's go ahead and look at that, verses 9 through 13 in chapter 6. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day your daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is a passage that is so rich. I, we could break this up in so many different ways. We could, we, could, we could look at every little word, little phrase, every verse. I mean, if you really were to sit down and think about each syllable, there's depth, there's richness to what Jesus prayed here. It's not just some thing we memorize and give out rotely. Let's think about it. I'm not gonna get into all of those things. I wouldn't have time. <laughs> Um, so I'd like to pull out five principles here. Five principles where the Lord's Prayer informs us on a way we can think about Christian living. And the first principle we've already been talking about, it's worship, adoration. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. When we say that, we're recognizing who God is. He is holy. He is worthy and he's deserving of praise. So the first principle is worship him. But let's define worship for a second. Worship is not the songs that we just sang over here. It's actually not music at all. Music can certainly be an expression of worship to God, but it's not the true mode of worship. The true mode of worship is how we live. Yes, we should certainly sing a song, but the real worship is a life that is holy and acceptable to God. Paul said, this is our spiritual worship. All things are spiritual. So worship does not begin with the first strike of a key on the keyboard or the first note and lyric sung. It starts with our hearts. It starts with our transformed lives. As we seek and draw nearer to God and grow as believers in maturity, we need to adjust our thinking and our hearts to view everything we do as an opportunity to worship God. The pursuit of holiness and spiritual maturity is described in the second verse of Romans 12 and gives insight on how we should think about a life that worships him. And I'll start actually in verse one. I appeal to you therefore brothers by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship? Then the command. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. As Christians, we are called to stand. We're called to make a choice to either be like the world or be transformed into Christ's character by renewing our mind according to the truth of his word. The more our mind is renewed with truth and we become transformed as his new creations, our vision becomes keener in discerning those things in life that are good and acceptable. The opposite is true. 
if we are not filling our minds with God's truth and actively putting this truth into practice, then our vision is clouded. Our choices often poorly reflect Christ's character and biblical principle, and we might not even realize it. This is why true worship begins internally, in the heart. Transformation begins on the inside, not the outside. So what is the internal attitudes that we hold on to? Are there roots of anger, bitterness, unforgiveness? How about pride, envy, or jealousy? Are we impatient? Are we distracted? Are we focused on worldly pleasures or worldly problems? If we enter into a music worship service, for example, with these attitudes or heart conditions, we are surely not able to sing with all to our God. The standard is higher than Sunday morning worship services. The standard is applied to all of our life. So if I hold on to these internal attitudes, um, for example, then my actions, words, thoughts throughout the week will both not honor God and not edify the people around me. My life will not worship him. But if we apply Romans 12, 2 here and renew our minds with his truth, the truth of his word and apply it, then as we grow, these internal attitudes of sin begin to be replaced with Christ-like qualities, such as meekness, kindness, self-control, mercy, forgiveness, peace, humility, contentment, long-suffering, and greatest of all, love. These qualities in action are to be applied to all areas of life, and that's how we worship God. That's how we bring him glory. We should make an important observation here. If you seek to do this in your own strength, you will surely fail. We sang a song earlier, yet not I, but through Christ in me. We have the responsibilities to renew our minds and to take steps of faith and obedience. So there is a work we do. But it is God, because of Christ in us and through the power of the Holy Spirit, that brings forth good fruit. Consider this take on the issue by C.S. Lewis. That is why the Christian is in a different position from other people who are trying to be good. They hope, by being good, to please God if there is one, or if they think there is not, at least the hope to deserve approval from good men. But the Christian thinks any good he does comes from the Christ life inside him. He does not think God will love us because we are good, but that God will make us good because he loves us. Just as the roof of a greenhouse does not attract the sun because it is bright, but becomes bright because the sun shines on it. We can end the sermon right there. I mean, what a, what a truth to recognize. Too often, we try to earn salvation. We try to earn approval, and we fail. Too often, we try to be as good as as possible and try to make zero mistakes in life and we fail. In the world, perhaps the approval of others is based on what we do successfully and how well we do it, meeting their standard of good. But the kingdom of God is different. It starts with the reality that God's standard is too high and impossible for us to meet. God's standard of holiness, his law, is impossible for man. We cannot possibly keep it. And we must come to that realization. This humility and brokenness from realizing I can't do it is what drives us to our knees in a new realization. To again quote C.S. Lewis, all this trying to be good leads us to the vital moment at which you turn to God and say, you must do this, I can't. This is why Christ had to die on the cross for our sins. This is what the Pharisees had gotten wrong about the whole purpose of the law to begin with. The law had always had the purpose of shining a light on our sin in complete lack of holiness. Jesus' death and resurrection paid the price we could not pay and justified us before God. Thus, our righteousness before God is assured 
when we stand before him at judgment, if we are in Christ and Christ is in us, amen? No human effort could possibly earn the forgiveness of God. And we're going to talk about that theme later as well. Yet, we're still here, right? We're still living in the world. We have this promise, this blessed hope that God will declare us righteous in the end. But while we live in this world, we are still called to walk a walk worthy and pursue the righteousness of Christ, being daily transformed. There is something we must do, but the power and strength to do it only comes through Christ. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. God does this work in us because he loves us. He does not love us because of what we do. This leads to the second principle that we can pull from the Lord's Prayer. Verse 10 says this, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If the first principle of Christian living is a life that is good and worships God at all times, and the only way we can possibly do this is through Christ in us, then the second principle must be that of surrender. To declare your kingdom come, your will be done, is to say, have your way, Lord, you, not me. There is a danger in recognizing I can't be good, which is what we have to recognize. The danger is we give up. I can't do it, so I'm not even gonna try anymore. But the I can't is necessary to bring us to our knees in humility and brokenness where the only way to look is up at the cross and declare, I surrender, have your way in me, do your mighty work in me, do only what you can do in me. What's next is a choice. If I surrender to the will of God and allow him to control and discipline my life, then I must also choose to obey his commands and walk according to his word. Surrender means giving up my will, my ways, my opinions, my preconceived ideas, my desires, my purposes, and replacing all of them with God's. Understanding surrender in this way helps enlighten passages often taken out of context, like Psalm 37.4 where it says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Why will God give me the desires of my heart? Because it is delighted in the Lord. It is focused on him and his will. It is a heart that's surrendered to God, meaning my desires are in tune with his desires. Can you imagine if I had the entire worship team tune their instruments differently? That would be a sweet sound in the ear, right? No, we, we purposely tune our instruments, and sometimes if we don't change our strings soon enough, it's constant tuning it, so it is a pleasant sound. That's the same with our lives. Sometimes we try to live our own way, but still try to come back into God's world. But our, our own way it would be like tuning your guitar over here, and I won't go through the strings and all that stuff, to say it's a different tune. And it might sound pleasant to you, but God has one tuning that his instrument is tuned to. And the only way is to match the tuning. The principle of surrender is reflected in the first part of the greatest commandment as well. Love the Lord your God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. So then true worship, if we go back to the first principle, requires the whole person to live righteous with the whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. But this is only possible as we surrender the whole heart, soul, mind, and strength to God and his ways. Again, Romans 12, 2 is applicable here. Our surrender to God occurs as we are transformed by the renewing of our mind and by the rejecting of the ways of the world as we decided to not live like the world, being conformed to it. Surrender is a necessary attitude and decision if we are to live out the third principle. So we have a life that worships God that we can't do. Well, we can do, but with Christ, which requires the second principle of surrender. 
third principle, if we look at verse 11, we're saying, give us this day our daily bread. It's realizing that God provides for our needs. He is our provision. Jesus, in fact, expanded on this theme later in verses 25 to 33, culminating with the seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He spends quite a few verses going through the anxiety of the day. You know, basic needs like food, drink, and clothing. Jesus assured his listeners that God cares enough to provide for other elements of his creation, such as birds in the air and grass in the field. Should he not be trusted to do the same for you who are made in his image? Jesus' conclusion to a sewage anxiety over such things was, again, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. We are often tempted to worry and fear over what's going to happen next in life, whether it's basic necessities, finances, relationships, health, jobs, uncertainty in the various happenings around the country and the world. Just look at the state of the world right now. We often fall into worry, fear, doubt, and anxiety. We must start with this attitude of surrender and a renewed mind focused on truth to come to a place where we can throw our hands up in the air and declare, Lord, I trust you to provide for my needs. I trust you to be my healer. I trust you to work all things together for the good in my life. In the same way that pursuing good and holy living that glorifies God requires a realization that we need Christ to do it, so also do we need to come to a place of humility where we can't fix the conditions around us that cause anxiety. Perfect peace comes when we surrender all situations to Christ and stop trying to accomplish everything in our own strength. The provision for whatever situation provision is needed will come, but according to God's way, in his time, and according to his purposes. The get difficulties and lack of peace and joy in life come when we pursue the provision and the relief from circumstances rather than God himself. Let me say that again. Lack of peace and joy in life comes when we pursue the provision. It comes when we pursue relief from circumstances rather than when we pursue God himself. It will continue until we switch the direction of our pursuit. We may call this anxiety or reacting from fear or even a determination to solve a problem, even just determine, no, I've got to fix it, I've got to fix it. But the truth is it's all pride. Pride to think we can force the answer to the problem when the answer is always and only Christ. Pride to think that I have the answer and I just got to get everybody else on board with it instead of recognizing that the answer is Christ and it could be completely and totally opposite of what I feel and think. We must surrender to God's will and trust his way of provision. But this all begins with the renewal of our mind. Back to the first principle, being filled with his truth, a life that worships him. What truth? We could read the entire Bible here. Not going to do that. But how about this truth from Philippians 4.8? Finally, brothers, whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is anything excellent, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What are we thinking about? Or how about Romans 8, 28? And we know for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are calling to their own purposes. No, to his purposes. Or how about Romans 8, 37 to 39? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Or a verse we quoted often already, Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. 
Let's keep going. John 15, 16 to 17 says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. That's some pretty good truth right there. That doesn't make me feel anxious. That makes me feel at peace. I mean, there's the uncertainty because there's a lot of trust that's involved here, right? But when we're surrendered, when we've given up trying to do it in our own strength, then we're in a place where we can trust. But if I'm trying to control my whole situations and I'm trying to control everybody else around me for my situations, I'm not going to be at peace. And I'm certainly not surrendered to God. We just sometimes have to let go and let God, right? We hear that expression all the time. Um, it's overused, but it's really about trust. The heart trusting and surrendered to God. But consider this last passage I just read. He's appointed us to bear fruit. For what purpose? That you love one another. And this is a good lead into the fourth principle that we see here. The thing that puts up a barrier between us in God, the thing that would cause us to be apart from that vine that we bear fruit from is sin. And it must be dealt with. Verse 12 says, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. This principle has two sides to it. On the one, there's a need to apply this principle of confession of sin so that we may receive his forgiveness. On the other hand, there's a principle of forgiveness. We're called to issue the same forgiveness that was given to us for sinning against God to others for sinning against us. In confession, we start with attitudes of being poor in spirit and mourning over sin. Being poor in spirit means a humility to recognize we have sin and our sin has offended God. Mourning over that sin means we are broken over it and literally mourn over how it has impacted God. Jesus described this in this very same sermon, a chapter earlier. It's the, the first two Beatitudes. We're then reminded of Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All includes me. We often are too focused on the faults of others that we neglect to consider our condition, my condition, before God. An attitude of pride will be quick to point out what others need to change. Oh, they got to do that. But the more we um, gain humility, we will recognize that I have sin in my life that I need to deal with. God, God will work with them. God, I need you to do a work in me. The more we grow and mature and draw closer in relationship to God, the more his holiness and righteous character shines a light on our own sin. We really should be so blinded and disgusted by the sin his holiness reveals in us that I don't even have the sight to be pointing out the faults in others. It's ironic the more we are transformed into the image of Christ, the more aware we become of how sinful we are. In fact, in our immaturity, we do not think there is much we need to change, and we often compare ourselves favorably to others' sins and others' imperfections. At least I don't do that. As we become more spiritually mature, we are less concerned with how sinful others are because we have a brighter light revealing just how much we fall short of the glory of God. Paul himself is the best example of this. If you consider the letters he wrote, you can kind of break them up into three periods of time. In his earliest letters, when he was beginning his ministry and recently converted, he declared that he was the least of the apostles. If you go to the middle letters, um, he explained that he's the least of all the saints. He started comparing himself to other Christians, and he's like, ah, I'm pretty much worse than they are. When writing his final letters shortly before his ministry would end, he declared himself 
the chief of all sinners. He was growing. He was maturing. I mean, we think of Paul as this big, oh, who's Paul? He was a man just like everybody else, and he had growth and maturity to do. And as he grew, as he was transformed, he became more and more aware of how wretched he was and how much he needed the grace of God and the forgiveness of God and how much he needed Christ in him to continue this walk. This sheds light in a statement like in Philippians 3, where he says, not that I have attained, but I press on. This is exactly what happened to Isaiah as well in his vision in Isaiah 6. You know, in Isaiah 6, Isaiah is, is taken into a vision where he sees heaven, he sees the temple, he sees the train of God's robe filling it. And all of a sudden Isaiah recognizes that he's standing before the glory and holiness of God and he falls to his knees and he says, woe is me for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Praise the Lord that he sent Jesus to pay the debt that we could not pay. That our sins and past failures have been wiped clean by the blood of the Lamb. Sin is the barrier that prevents us from having fellowship with God. That separates us from the life-giving vine. That hinders and corrupts the life of worship. That prevents surrender and makes us blind to the provision and work that God is actively doing around us. This is why confession is such an important element of Christian living. We must acknowledge sin, repent, and accept the forgiveness of God through Jesus Christ. And guess what? It's just sitting right there, offered, ready for you to take. Now that we have been forgiven, there is a responsibility laid on us to also forgive others. This is the second part of the great commandment put into action. Love others as yourself. Yourself was forgiven by God. If I'm going to love others, then I must forgive as God has forgiven me. We were forgiven. Therefore, we forgive others. We do not hold on to anger and bitterness. We do not keep a record in a list of wrong. We do not demand an apology or compensation to give love and forgiveness. We simply forgive as we were forgiven. We did not earn the forgiveness given to us. We just established that. We literally can't do it. We did not deserve the forgiveness that was offered to us. God didn't have to do it. We did and said nothing for the forgiveness that was offered for us. Forgiveness was simply offered. The debt we owed absorbed and paid by the very one that we offended through Jesus Christ. Can you imagine that? Somebody owes you a debt? You're like, nah, I'll take the hit. You know, somebody offends you and hurts you? Nah, it's all right. It would be like going to a courtroom today where you are um, pressing charges against somebody who um, assaulted you violently, right? And um, you, you're the one that got hurt. And it's, the, the evidence is overwhelming. There was cameras, there was witnesses. Um, the guy ran out and bragged about doing it. And you get into the courtroom um, and the verdict guilty has been handed down and then you get up out of your seat and you stand in front of the judge and you're like, I don't mean to cause a problem here, but I'd like to go to jail for this person. I'll take the penalty that he deserves even though he's hurt me and the judge is gonna look at you all cross-eyed like what? He's the one that attacked you. He's like, yeah, I don't care. Um, I forgive him, and not only that, I'm going to take and absorb the cost of what he did to me. So, lock me up. Can you imagine doing that in today's world? We get so easily offended, we want to beat everybody up for the smallest thing, let alone something bigger. Repentance was not an action that we did to earn forgiveness. We need to make that clear, too. Repentance merely put us in the proper position to see Jesus' outstretched arm offering the forgiveness that was already there. Remember, repentance you can look at as a 180 degree turn from your sin. So if Jesus is over there and I'm engaged over here, I can't see Jesus. Repentance is turning from the sin 
And oh look, the entire time I was racked with guilt, racked with anxiety, in pain and suffering, no peace, um, engaged in all sinful activity that I didn't know what to do. Jesus had always been there with his arm stretched out saying, here, take, I love you, I forgive you, join me in my kingdom. I had to repent to see that, but repentance was not what I did to earn that because I can do nothing to earn that. Paul described the model of forgiveness and grace like this in Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died, Christ died for us. So actually, my, my courtroom scenario wasn't even accurate. That means he's, as he's getting beaten by this guy, I'm like, I forgive you, and when you get arrested, I'm going to take the penalty for it. That was God. This is the standard to which we are then held. We're, we're to take on Christ's character. We're to model what he did. So that same attitude of forgiveness is the standard we are held to with relation to others. The result of unforgiveness and bitterness is, in fact, sin, which hinders our ability to worship. It prevents true surrender and causes us to miss the provision that God has for us. In fact, unforgiveness, bitterness, anger, it causes the opposite effect in our lives. Henriksen, who I'm, I quoted at the beginning of this message, said it this way, bitterness comes as a result of real or supposed ill treatment. It doesn't really matter which. Somebody may really wrong you, or you may just think that somebody wronged you. In either case, if you are not careful, it can cause you to become bitter. The root of bitterness can come from a competitive spirit, a breakdown in communications between you and fellow Christians, or from feeling that you have gotten a raw deal. I believe more disciples become ineffective in the Christian life because of a root of bitterness than because of any other sin. Faithful Christians guard their hearts well in this critical area. Earlier we discussed Jesus addressing the anxiety of believers over their circumstances and basic needs. Really, these people were robbing themselves of peace and joy because of their internal fear. When we hold on to bitterness, when we don't forgive others and pursue a path forward of peace, when we demand our way as a condition for moving on in love and relationship, then we violate every principle that we've just discussed this morning. First, our life of worship is a life that honors God through Christ's character. He modeled peace, love, kindness, meekness, forgiveness, and humility. Therefore, bitterness, anger, and a spirit of unforgiveness are the opposite of this, and God is not honored. And the second principle, when we hold on to offense and demand justice our way, we make the decision to take control instead of surrendering the situation to God, allowing him to impact both parties in the situation. Third, we become blind to God's provision and moving in the situation. Maybe he's already been at work and you're just missing it because our focus is on ourselves. The pursuit is always God alone, never the situation, never the need, never the other person even. It's only God. And finally, in the spirit of this fourth principle, it's like we become like the unmerciful servant. You're all familiar with that parable, where the master forgives one servant in immense debt. Um, people think it would have been into the million, like some crazy number. It's a parable, so it's meant to communicate a huge amount that there's no way he would have been able to pay. And he accepts the forgiveness from his master and then goes to this other person that owes him a much lesser debt and says, you can't pay it? No, go to jail. Jesus rejected that unmerciful servant. It's interesting that Jesus actually picks up on this issue at the, after the prayer concludes in Matthew 6, verses 14 and 15. For if you forgive people their sins your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive people, neither will your Father forgive your sins. It really has to do with the attitude of the heart. Like, if your heart's truly been transformed, you're going to forgive. 
And if it's, a, if it's a difficulty, then you know that we need to pursue God in a much greater way and then watch all of these principles unfold. It seems our world, our nation, and our culture today is founded upon the principles of division, argument, fruitless debate, hanging things over people's heads and fighting. We see it all over Facebook and social media. We see it in the news. We see it in our politicians. Unfortunately, we, we see it in the church too. I'm sure the result, as you felt it, even just watching it is a lack of peace. Some of you might have even gotten rid of social media and stopped watching the news just because of what it stirred up inside of you and you didn't like it. There's a reason why you didn't like it. Those feelings are counter Christ's character. Those feelings aren't supposed to exist in us as believers. So the culture around us obviously needs to be impacted and we can begin to impact the culture around us as we begin to model the right principles. Principles such as forgiveness that we see in the Lord's Prayer. As we forgive others and pursue a path forward based on peace, leaving the past behind, we can show the world the love of Jesus Christ in action and reveal the kind of forgiveness he has for them. What if the image that our country saw was the image of God's love and forgiveness shown not just within Christian community, but to everybody that we come in contact with. It's like, how, how, can you, how can you still be friends with that person after what they said to you? I heard them say it, because that's what Christ did for me. Simple answer. You know, and at first they might mock you and ridicule you. That, that is promised, by the way. You're gonna get mocked and ridiculed for your faith. But as those seeds are sown, maybe down the road that same person will come up to you and like, how, why are you the way that you are? And no longer is he saying that in an offensive way. He's now saying that, and please tell me more about this Jesus. But it starts with us modeling the behavior. So we are truly forgiven so that we can forgive others as an awesome model of the gospel of Jesus Christ and ultimately point the unbelieving world around us to the greatest love of all, Jesus. As we recognize that sin is an issue that must be dealt with and we must be vigilant to root out of our lives, it is imperative that we apply this fifth and final principle to our daily walk with God. And that's seeking God's protection. Verse 13 says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. A common thread through everything we've discussed this morning is our need for God and his strength to live out this Christian life. In our own strength and abilities, we cannot possibly break the hold of sin and temptation in our lives. The path forward, however, requires us to resist sin. I think James gives us some good insight about this in James 4, 7, and 8. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Resisting sin and pursuing righteousness is not centered on ourselves in our battle with sin. It is centered on God, as everything else we've talked about. It's the pursuit of God. We need to surrender to God before the power and strength to resist the devil will come. We need to draw near to him, seek him and his righteousness, and he will provide. We need to recognize sin, root it out, and remember the power that comes because of the forgiveness through Christ. Therefore, we confess in our sins and repent. All the while, we must maintain a foundational attitude of humility where we know it is not me, but Christ in me that brings transformation and the strength to overcome sin and pursue holiness. We're not looking to be put in the way of temptation. We are actively looking to avoid any opportunity situation that might even open a mouse-sized hole to sin. Yet, we must be of the humble mind that no matter how mature in the faith we are, all sin and fall short of the glory of God. And we need to vigorously pursue God to protect our hearts and minds from the pathways of sin and worldliness. Draw near to him, and he will draw near to you. So as we make this decision to follow Christ, we recognize that this choice is a lifestyle decision. 
The name Jesus is to overtake every area of life. In this way, we determine to live a life of worship where our character, habits, conduct, words, actions, and thoughts, no matter how big or small, no matter the circumstances, brings honor to God and aligns with the command to be holy as he is holy. Key to this principle is first realizing being good is about being good according to God's standard and therefore it is something we can't do. This reality brings us to the humble and broken place of declaring, I need Jesus. It is not I, but Christ in me that can do this. This transformation in every area of life can only take place as we surrender to God, relying on his strength and submitting to his way, his timing and his rules in our life. Not our will, but his will be done. As we surrender, we also rely on him for every need and provision. Whether basic necessities or relief in circumstances that cause anxiety and lack of peace, the source of our provision is only found in our great God. The place to start is filling our mind with his truth found in his word. Clearly, Christian living means to be close to God, which means removing the barrier between us and God, which is sin. This is where that fourth principle of confession and forgiveness comes in where we acknowledge and take responsibility for our sin, placing us in a position to receive the free gift of grace and forgiveness that was already there for us. Through Christ and his forgiveness, the barrier of sin is removed. The responsibility we have as a result of being forgiven is to extend the same forgiveness to others. We are forgiven so that we may also forgive. We cannot allow roots of bitterness and unforgiveness and anger to take hold. The goal in our lives is eternal and revolves around the pursuit of God and his holiness. As we walk each day, we need his strength and power to overcome sin and temptation in our lives. We must seek him more and more and ask for his protection from the temptation of sin. This again begins in his word, but also relationships of accountability in Christian community, a family of families. So I want you to be encouraged that Though the standard is impossible, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, who strengthens us. That is the proper context of that verse, by the way. Though the next steps may be uncertain to us and the circumstances out of our control, God surely does work all things together for the good for those who love him and called according to his purposes. But let's leave here challenged too. As we apply the way of Jesus in bringing honor to him to every area of life, let's be challenged to be willing to let go and let God in every situation as we surrender and trust his provision. And let us start by committing to drawing near to God through the study of his word, through prayer, through the fellowship of believers, a commitment to discipleship and spiritual growth. God certainly does love us and draw us to himself though we are imperfect, but his love should forever change us. Let our response be worship, not just in the song that we sing, but in the lives that we live. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you, Father God, for who you are. Lord, we thank you for your love. Lord, we thank you that your love extended forgiveness to us for a debt that we could not pay. Lord, we want our lives to be lives that bring glory to you, that worship you, Father God. Lord, we want to love you with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. But Lord, we need you to do that. We surrender to you this morning, Father God. Lord, we declare that only you provide. Only you bring the change, Lord. Lord, we say that only you have power. Only you have authority to move. Why? Because through you, sin was erased. Lord, you've forgiven us, Father. We confess our sins to you. We confess our wrongs, Father. Lord, we declare that you are king, that there is no one like you, Father. Lord, as you have forgiven us, give us the strength to let go and forgive others, Father. Not just for ourselves and the other person, Lord, but even as a testimony to the world around us, Father. 
And Lord, as we continue, protect us, Father. Guide us, Lord. Lord, help us to see clearly and discern your truth, Lord, as we make decisions to actively avoid worldliness and sin in favor of you. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name.